Good evening, everyone. Thank you for taking time out on this gorgeous summer day. I want to encourage everybody to note there are a couple Twitter handles here that if you feel so inclined during the meeting, those are some that you might want to use. And since we're at 6.15 or so, let's kick things off. So, agenda for tonight. Uh, we're going to have a few quick announcements, very few. Um, we're going to have Sean, a fellow member, come up and do a member conversation piece on some interesting stuff that he's been working on. Our main presentation... <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Not that? No. Okay. Um, Close. There. See how long this lasts. Um, okay, so our main presentation tonight is Thomas Wester. Uh, this individual was demonstrating um, down at the uh, Vision Summit. Uh, Vision Summit, right? Mm -hmm. um, 2017, we're down in LA, and I saw his presentation. And I said, wow, this is really cool use of Holland's technology. Ends up he's kind of almost a next door neighbor just here in Portland, Oregon area. So we talked and arranged for him to come out and speak. Uh, as usual, we will have a few door prizes at the end after um, all the presentations. And then there should be pizza arriving and we have about 45 minutes or an hour or so for conversations, mingling, socializing, and some really cool demos tonight. Um, both presenters are bringing in some, some cool stuff that you can experience, so I'm hoping you can stick around and uh, try some multi-user demos and um, see a peek of some new hardware, right? Cool. So, really great night tonight. Um, as always, there's a ton of stuff going on in the industry. These are the three things that stuck out since we met last that I thought you guys should know about if you haven't heard about. The Acer Immersive uh, Mixed Reality HMD headsets are starting to show up in the wild. As a matter of fact, you're going to see one of the wild ones here tonight. Uh, Mixed Reality Partner Program is uh, by Microsoft is opening up to accepting new partners, and it seems like they're accepting new partners at a slightly different um, level than the very aggressive um, uh, level that they were at before. It was quite exclusive. So if you're working in this space, you may want to check out their Mixed Reality Partner Program off of the main HoloLens page. Uh, there's an application. You can tell them a little bit about what you're working on and see if you can get into that partner program if you're interested in working with them, which I'm sure you would be. And Unity 2017.1 uh, was released, I believe, yesterday. So uh, we're switching over from the last generation 5.6 Unity to a new subscription model um, going forward to 2017 version, and they've released a whole bunch of cool new features as far as uh, performance and a uh, wide variety of stuff, including a lot of the AR and immersive headset stuff is coming in this edition. The particular stuff for the Acer doesn't seem to be there yet, but they're announcing in their notes, if you read details, that it's coming soon. So that'll be in the 2017 version. And I believe the licensing model, other than they're no longer allowing you to purchase it outright, I still think they have the free version and, and the level that if you're using it professionally that you can subscribe at a professional level, a couple different ways. I should ask, since I only have three points here, anybody in the audience have anything that stands out from a HoloLens uh, Microsoft Mixed Reality point of view that they might have caught that I didn't that they think is worth mentioning? Yes? I brought some couple of demos here. You brought some demos? Yeah. So, that's not an industry thing, but that's a cool thing for tonight. So we're going to have probably about half a dozen or more HoloLenses from the looks of things and a lot of interesting stuff to see tonight. Anything else that anybody wanted to pipe in or local, local uh, activity that they want to share about? No? Okay. So let's roll right into things. I'm going to introduce Sean Ong. Uh, you may already know him. He's very active on uh, YouTube and, and other mediums. He's, uh, I believe, involved in at least one regular show with uh, another fellow. Uh, I used to be. Not okay, I'll let him give you the, the details. 
And while I pass the mic over to him, I'm going to switch over to his slide deck. Thank you, Duane. Uh, so yeah, I work on a lot of different HoloLens projects, uh, personal projects, fun projects, community projects. Uh, you may have seen one hit the store, uh, I think almost two weeks ago now. It's a holographic uh, chat application, so you can actually jump into an application. It's called Mix3D, M-Y-X-D-3D. Uh, you can actually jump into the HoloLens and see uh, a robot avatar of somebody else who may be in any part of the world as if they're actually in your room. I'm going to share the clicker, but it's a very short distance, so okay. you have to <laughs> squeeze over here. Thanks, Dwayne. Yeah, so, uh, but one of the projects that I'm super excited about and uh, why I'm here today uh, is this project that uh, is ongoing, uh, I'm still working on it, but it's for a, a large firm in Dubai. Uh, they build a lot of different skyscrapers. So if you go to Dubai, uh, the, you'll see uh, many different buildings, commercial buildings, residential buildings, built by this firm called uh, Dayar. And one of their new buildings that they're building uh, is called the Atria. It's uh, quite a massive building. You'll see some uh, video footage a little bit later. And they wanted to do something a little bit different this time. Uh, typically, they have a sales team that will travel all over the world, Europe, China, you name it, and will show uh, potential buyers of these luxury apartments, uh, brochures, videos, pictures. Uh, but uh, they wanted to go beyond the, the 2D. You know, they wanted to go beyond even the, the 360, which is really good, and I'll talk about that a little bit here, but kind of a more immersive uh, experience. So they decided to uh, reach out to me and uh, develop this uh, 3D immersive uh, experience, which I'll go into more detail. So these, uh, what you see here, this is not a HoloLens rendering, uh, if you imagine. <laughs> mm -hmm. These are actual photographs of the apartment itself. And uh, I actually went and took measurements, took pictures to be able to recreate it. Uh, this is a 3D scan, so I actually went to the, the, the building is, is really dangerous. There's construction all over, stuff, you know, dirt flying in your eyes and just, you know, lots of people going back and forth. And you walk up this really scary stairwell and go all the way down this, you know, electrical wires hanging down. It's really dark, really kind of dystopian and scary. But then you open the door and suddenly you're in this really nice uh, place, you know, and it's kind of like, whoa, what's going on here? <laughs> Uh, but it's, it's a show place. But as you can imagine, it's really hard for them to bring even local people there. You know, people who are wanting to buy luxury apartments, they're not really going to want to walk through all that stuff before seeing this. Uh, so, you know, what they're wanting is not just for international uh, buyers, but also local buyers as well. So I went into the apartment and I immediately turned on my uh, spatial mapping in the HoloLens and walked around and got a really good uh, mesh of the entire place. Uh, you know, as, as detailed as I could, uh, just through the device portal. So this is not any fancy application I developed. Uh, and the purpose of that was to be able to start to recreate. So you can see my 3D artist uh, that I've been working with uh, started to use the mesh that I came up with as well as some measurements that I took and some photographs to be able to start to recreate this apartment for the HoloLens. Uh, so you can see this is uh, uh, partway through. This is not the final thing. I actually do have the application here with me today and I'm going to demo it uh, a little bit later. You can see what it looks like in its current state. Uh, so this is the part of the recreated project. Uh, you can see this is with some of the textures on it. Uh, uh, of course, it's a little bit uh, blurry on the screen here, but if you look at it through the HoloLens, it, it looks quite nice. So what's special about this is that it really g allows you to uh, immerse yourself in the apartment without actually being there. You can actually walk around, you can move furniture around, you can uh, feel the volume of the area, you can get a sense for the size of the area. So these are just a few pictures. Now one question I've gotten a lot since I started this project was why HoloLens? You know, why not VR? Because HoloLens is really meant for applications where you take a, an object and augment it into your scene. Uh, whereas VR is uh, more suited for immersive experience where you're wanting to go somewhere else. So because this is an apartment and you're wanting to kind of go somewhere else and not see anything about your real world, wouldn't this be better suited for VR? So it turns out this company, Dayar, actually approached uh, uh, 
Oculus uh, developers first because they wanted to build this in VR. But they found out, when they found out that you had to be tethered, uh, you had to set up sensors, right? And you had to have a, you kind of had to lug around a big desktop PC with you, uh, you know, gaming PC basically. Uh, that was really kind of a deal breaker for them because they've got their sales teams that go everywhere. So uh, they reached out to me and they, they you know, got to try on the HoloLens and uh, got to test it out. And they realized that, you know, even though you have a, a, a field of view and you can't see stuff in your peripheral vision, the fact that all you need to do is take this with no computer required, no setup required, you can take this anywhere uh, and multiple devices if you wanted a shared experience, that to them was way, way better than uh, what the current uh, VR solutions offered in terms of simplicity and being able to take it around. Uh, plus, these are uh, marketing and sales people and they want to be able to directly engage with their potential buyers. So being able to see them make eye contact or have some sort of you know, feeling that they're not kind of locked away uh, was important to them as well. So I, I thought that was quite fascinating because when we first started the project, I was also trying to push them towards VR and say, you know, this might not be the best application for a HoloLens. But after talking and hearing some of their concerns, then it, it, it started to make sense. So uh, as I mentioned, shared. So this is a shared uh, application. So you can have uh, many different HoloLens devices together and you see each other in the scene. So a salesperson can come and say, hey, why don't you come look at this sofa right over here and watch as I move the sofa, watch as I rearrange this, or, or, or you know, somebody who's interested in the apartment might want to rearrange some of the furniture and have a discussion with uh, maybe their partner or somebody that they're wanting to you know, show off the apartment to. So having that interactive shared experience uh, was definitely key for this application. Uh, teleportation, so you can imagine if you see a huge apartment over here and you're in a small space and you, you hit against the wall, that's an issue, right? So uh, yeah, if you're in a big warehouse or a big open area, you can physically walk around without needing to teleport, but I did build teleportation into this application so that you could actually go to different places and bring everyone in the shared experience along with you. So that was a, a little bit challenging to implement, but you know, once I got all the the sharing and the geometry, right, it was uh, pretty good. It's actually pretty smooth. You can try it out a little bit later. Uh, so 360 degree image versus full 3D. So this is something that there was a little bit of a debate within DAR. You know, they were saying, well, you know, that we, we, we like the, you know, what you've done, but it's not quite photorealistic, you know, which, is, which was a, a little bit of an issue. And I said, uh, and I explained to them that if you want photorealism, got to use photographs you know even in today's uh, most expensive movie budgets you know the 3d scenes that are really photorealistic it takes sometimes per frame hours to render on very very powerful PC you know we're rendering 30 to 60 frames per second uh, per eye so double that you know in real time so kind of uh, you know telling them a little bit about the, the limitations uh, and also I'm oh, sorry I'm losing my train of thought here uh, also, the the big aspect for them was the volume. You know, being able to experience the volume, being able to walk around a room, and being able to experience the size of the bed, uh, the size of a sofa, the size of a bathroom, the size of the living room. Uh, that's something that pictures kind of skew a little bit. If you've ever looked at housing pictures and you've ever looked at real estate, they kind of stretch the pictures out, and you don't get a true sense for how big the place actually is. Uh, so that's that's something where the, the 3D experience really added value in this uh, scenario. Uh, so render quality, I kind of actually jumped to that a little bit. Uh, talked about render quality and photorealism versus uh, what you can run on the HoloLens. Uh, so this was initially a concern for they are, but after you know after explaining to them about the technology and where the HoloLens is and how everything's being processed and rendered on this device and you don't have to be connected to a powerful PC uh, and explaining to them about photorealism that, that kind of really helped. Let's go to the next slide. Marketing. So this was actually pretty big for DAR. Uh, they wanted to uh, demonstrate that they are 
a leader in technology, you know, and they, uh, they've been seeing kind of the rise of uh, mixed reality, uh, augmented and virtual reality. And uh, this was really kind of their, their big jump into uh, you know, embracing a new technology. And everything that they're doing right now is actually really experimental. You know, it's that uh, uh, we're still kind of waiting to get a bunch of feedback from as when the sales team goes out and uses these HoloLens to actually start selling these units. And you know, I'll definitely keep you guys posted on that. Uh, but you know, as far as being able to tout uh, they are as a, a company that's really forward-looking and you know having access to this technology and this capability, that was a, a pretty big selling point uh, for they are as well. All right. Uh, so you see here, uh, question. I do have a video I want to show you, but before showing the video, uh, actually, maybe maybe we'll do the video. I've got this little Acer headset uh, that I'm going to be uh, hooking up to the back. I actually have my desktop back there, so if you'd like a demo of this, uh, it's pretty fun. I definitely highly recommend you at least try it for a few minutes. Uh, so let's go ahead and show the video really quick. That's not the door prize. That's not the door prize. <laughs> I wish I could give that away. But. <laughs> So I actually, uh, so I went through, I did the spatial mapping of the place. Uh, I took lots of pictures, lots of video, and I also, uh, uh, the, the, the artist that I've been, I was working with, you know, made a, a rough model, uh, which wasn't, it, it, the dimensions given to us uh, didn't quite match what was actually in the apartment. So what I ended up having to do was uh, using this uh, app to measure, this is actually an app you can download in the Windows Store, to actually measure all the dimensions of the uh, uh, the apartment and, and kind of take down notes, especially places where we saw that they didn't quite match up. Or oh wow, this this looks you know way different in in the dimensions you were given or the model you created. Uh, so this wasn't. So if we could pause just uh, briefly. So this wasn't part of uh, the main effort, but they provided me with a Revit file of the entire building. It's an it's uh, there's no apartments. Uh, 3D model in the building, that would have been nice and I wouldn't have had to recreate it. But it's got like the pillars and it's got the kind of the, you know, the balconies, the bricks, the windows and all that kind of stuff, the, the parking garages underneath. Uh, so I, they said, can you do anything with this? And I loaded it in the Holands. I told them it's extremely, you know, unoptimized. You know, I would have to basically rebuild it from scratch to make it optimal in the Holland. So it, it runs at a very, very low frame rate. but you can kind of, you know, put it on, on your construction site and visualize what your building would look like, uh, or maybe a little bit of what it would look like once it's complete. So this is just a little bit of fun footage. Again, this is not really part of the main project, and you'll see that the 3D model is definitely not optimized, but it's still kind of fun to, to show this. So that's me. So you can see here that that's the, the 3D model, the Revit model of the uh, building. And then I can turn it off and you can see this is what the actual construction site at the Atria looks right now. I think it's slated for completion next year. There you go, I turned it back on. So you can kind of get a feel for uh, if this model were optimized, you could actually walk around the entire building and, and see what the building would look like if it were complete, or maybe if you were part of the construction. Oh, this is a kind of a fun. I visited the Bur <laughs> the Burj Khalifa and had a little dinosaur kind of ram into it. <laughs> Action gram. <so laughs> That's just for a little bit of fun at the end. So uh, yeah, any questions? No. All right. Oh, yep. Did you try uh, working with like something like Gear VR or something? With Gear VR? Yeah. Yeah, I think the problem with that would, would have been a few things. The shared experience, they really wanted the shared experience. Uh, the ability to easily kind of uh, walk around your environment. Uh, you know, so not just look around, but walk around and also interact with objects. Uh, so I think the Gear VR, I think, would have definitely solved the, you know, the not being tethered issue and also not having to set up sensors issues. But there was still a few more limitations where uh, you know, that it would have been closed, but not quite there. Yep. Probably not so much to the uh, 
room, but the, the last one when you were overlaying, you know, the construction site. Yeah. How did you position? How did how accurate was the positioning of the Revit model to the actual build? I mean, how did you superimpose it? So I did it manually, so I could. I, I, yeah, so the, the question was in the video footage where I overlaid the construct the building model with the construction of the building, how you know how accurate was that? And uh, my answer is that I put in a capability to move around the model, uh, and so I, I kind of placed it and oriented it manually. Uh, but yeah, once I once I placed it, it was actually it lined up pretty well. So that uh, and it stayed pretty good when you're walking around. Yeah, yeah, except for the frame rate issue, of course. Right. So once you walk it. It, out of, it goes out of line, but then it kind of sinks back up. And that's mostly a performance issue. Yeah. Um, regarding the, the HoloLens, what would be maybe one or two top things that you kind of ran into and said, gee, I wish you did this or didn't do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the question was, uh, what are one of the, the top two things that I ran into with the HoloLens? I'd say the biggest, which is why I kind of focused on it during this presentation, the biggest hurdle and back and forth that I've had with Dayar was uh, the photorealism aspect. They really wanted the, the apartment to look as photorealistic as possible. And so that, that, you know, we had some back and forth conversation on that, but once they understood the, the benefits in terms of spatially, you know, what, what this is offering, uh, they were quite happy with it. The other, uh, uh, the other thing that I wished, I guess the HoloLens had was a, a more immersive uh, thing for really, you know, to have something on your desk, it's fine to have a smaller field of view because you know you're wanting to see your desk and you're wanting to see just the object. But when you're trying to immerse yourself in an environment, it's best to have as big of a real estate as possible. So, and you'll see if you if you try out the app, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, so I'd say yeah, I'd say probably those are the top two. Yes. You mentioned that it would be possible to like customize for, for uh, clients to like customize the space and move around furniture. Is that doable in the app right now? Or? Yeah, yep. Yeah. So you can try it. So as you move it around, everyone else, uh, how many Holands do did we have it so we installed have on? Three. We had okay. So I've got my app installed in my Holands, and I had uh, uh, Dwayne preloaded on three other Holands. So we can have four of us actually in the app rearranging furniture and walking around and stuff. So it'd be it's a pretty fun experience. Can you change the color of any furniture? Or do no, no. I mean, the can yes, but have I developed that you know <laughs> feature in? No, not quite. <laughs> that would be relatively easy though, and yeah, but I haven't done that. <laughs> uh, yes. So is it is that project live now, and are they like product delivered kind of thing, or what's the status? So it's it? it's ongoing. So they're doing field tests right now, and I don't know the results of that yet. But uh, if it's successful. You know, meaning if people respond to it positively, uh, then they're going to expand it to all their other buildings, and they they actually have a much bigger building right now that they're really looking to expand. This is just one apartment. There's actually several dozen different layouts, and they're wanting to expand it to all of that. So, yeah, I'm kind of uh, waiting patiently and you know seeing how that goes. <laughs> A few more hands, so I'm going to bring you a mic so that the people on the live stream can also hear the questions. You're okay with that? I think you are for that. Utility that you've built, trying to measure the, uh, you know, the greater two spatial points, mm -hmm. uh, that seems to be really cool. So, did you use pretty much more on Raycast to figure that out? So, that one's actually is, um, available in the Windows Store. I didn't develop that tool. Oh. That's just something I downloaded because I needed it on the fly. <laughs> Oh. I had measuring tape with me, but it was only, uh, I think it was six feet long. It wasn't long enough, you know, and I was, it was just wasting my time. So I ended up uh, just using that. And I tried a few, I tried to make sure it was accurate. I so my measuring tape. working both uh, width and length. Yeah, so it sped up my process a lot, yeah. So like, uh, to, move the, to move the furniture, do you use like the pinch and zoom, like that kind of, like use with the regular apps or do you use some Custom just so. Yeah, so, yep. so just pinch and drag. Okay. I just use the, the hand draggable uh -huh. script that's included with the whole toolkit. So nothing fancy. Okay. Uh, and like, did you implement it as a UWP or as a Unity app? Like? I developed it in Unity. Unity? Okay. Yeah. So the whole model is like uh, a skybox of, of some kind? Like. Uh, so it's just, it's just uh, black. 
if oh. you look outside, in the pictures you could see a skybox sky because I, I took a uh -huh. screenshot from Unity, okay. but in the HoloLens it's transparent. Okay, so okay. if you look so out the window, you'll see your environment, yeah. Any other questions? <laughs> sure, Thomas, delay your <laughs> <Delay Just stuff. laughs> No problem. <laughs> um, how did you how did you register once you're in the room, like once you're in the physical apartment and with the pilot, right, as they're going out and, and testing this out and getting feedback? How does that registration work? Do you start from a blank uh, a blank space and they place things in it, or how how do you kind of get so started? So the so the apartment starts with the default layout with all the furniture placed as you saw it in the image, and then from there people can move uh, the furniture around. And how do you? Like how do you place it, it? How does it? How do you register that when you boot up the uh, the Unity app? Like how does it know where to put the in default to put the sofa and that type of stuff? Uh, that's a good question. The way I developed it in Unity, uh, I just placed the objects in the scene in Unity. So when you deploy it to the Hololens, it it's okay. uh, as you see it in Unity. Now something that they wanted was to have the layout reset each time. You launch the app, so I don't save any of the right. the locations that they move. The so, yeah, you know, what I was just trying to think of is something I ran into with Hololens is it's wherever you're looking, right? Is where it, it sets a zero zero point, and mm -hmm. then it just boots up from there. Mm -hmm. So if I'm in a blank space and I want to always have the sofa, they register a specific wall. How do you oh. make sure that that sofa is always to that wall, or did you just give them the instructions like stand here, yeah. launch the app? Yeah, whenever you launch the app, you're always in front of this cool teleportation oh, okay, door. Yeah. Okay, right? great, yeah. So, so you yeah, see your, yeah. your real environment, you see this magical door, and you open the door and all of a sudden you enter into wow. this apartment okay, in Dubai, right? Yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> okay, cheers. Uh, what does the shared space box... Wait, wait, wait. Okay. I think we're, we're almost out of time, maybe. <laughs> the shared space? Yeah, so like, I have tried developing with the HoloLens, but I have never had the chance to have two HoloLens, so mm -hmm. I never tried with something like the two people will be in the same space. So one people, if one person moves a sofa, other like other person will also see it. So how do you like solve that pr problem to like real time shared space? Is that something that comes out of the box, or do you have to manually do that? It's it's included in the Hollow Toolkit. Oh. Okay. And uh, so the the MYXD app that I talked about at the beginning, that's done using a service called Photon. Okay. There's also Unit. So there's actually a lot of different services uh, okay, that so each has their pros and cons. Uh, for this app, I just used what was out of the box from the Hollow Toolkit. Uh -huh. It's pretty challenging to set up if you don't, I mean, getting the, the angles and the, the, the children and the parents right and all that stuff. It can be, uh, if, if, you're, if you don't if have a very strong background in understanding how that all fits together, uh, you can pull your hair out for sure. <laughs> but once, you, once it clicks, then yeah, then it works great. So I'm going to defer further questions to the conversation period later on. You'll be able to grab them personally and, and get all the details. I'm also going to use your question as an interesting segue. Sean used our Winhugger loaner program to get a multiple device so that he could try it on multiple devices. So we do have a number of units that are available as loaners to trusted Winhugger members. So. Um, there's an agreement that you need to sign, but if you are looking to do some development or do something like uh, test a multi-user experience, uh, you can contact me um, through my email uh, afterwards and we can uh, talk about the ability to lend out a device for a short period of time to do those kinds of tests and uh, to get things into the store and those kinds of efforts. So if you're limited to just the emulator or you're limited to a single device, I might be able to help in that way. So on that note, let me... Still late to show you this one slide. Thomas, I'm going to get you to come on up. As a matter of fact, yeah. So Thomas is going to take the stage. I'm going to put this mic back up here and give you totally the option of whichever one you want to use. Just switch that on. And before you plug in,
It's great to be up here, guys. Uh, thanks for having me. Um, I wanted to share a project that I had been working on uh, that we released earlier this year as a... Let me get it up here. Oh, yeah, right in my face. Let's do it. All right, we're going to talk about a project, an art project uh, for HoloLens that was basically the premiere for HoloLens uh, within uh, the independent film festival community. We premiered it at Sundance. Sundance is every year in January. Um, it's been running for 20 years and the Sundance Film Institute, um, they support innovative storytelling and innovation in film and in narrative storytelling through a program they call New Frontiers. And every year they, they get a selection and it's, it's a competitive selection where they try and find projects and incubate projects that kind of show uh, a different take or a different way of thinking about uh, how we tell stories and how we work with that. So that's kind of what I'm going to talk about. It's a slightly different take on HoloLens that, um, that I'm used to, <laughs> seeing everything that we've been working on. And when you really look at a business value, uh, these, these projects are not yet to a point where there's enough HoloLenses out that there's truly a distribution business value. But I think that there is a lot to learn from a design perspective and from a thinking and how you think about your experiences. So that's what I want to talk to you guys today. I want to keep it short um, and get the questions later and like have more one-on-one uh, -on -one, um, conversations and also give you the opportunity to, to, to see the, the, the demo of this, but also what Sean was showing, I think is a really interesting, the multi-user thing is a big deal for HoloLens um, that a lot of other VR sets are not solving yet. And so I, I really want to give some space for that. So I'm going to run through this a bit quickly, and I'll get bogged down too much. So about me, my background is uh, in interactive storytelling. I was at a, sec at a studio from 2003 to 2016 called Second Story. They're down in Portland. Um, we did a lot of interactive storytelling for museums, cultural institutions. And so that's my background. Um, but it's all screen-based, all 2D. Um, and more, more and more, uh, at Sixer, we do more and more exhibit design, and I was really interested in uh, kind of branching out and getting more into experimental experiences, experimental VR, experimental AR, and that's how I got to um, where I am today. And what really got me into HoloLens is I ran um, a Microsoft research-funded uh, uh, project down in Portland that created a holographic transmission for community college students. So this is part of the original um, academic launch of the HoloLens that we work with, the, with a bunch of students and that's a whole separate conversation. But if you want to talk about holographic transmissions later, we can talk about that too. So this is uh, Heroes and um, Heroes is an existing choreography. So it's a choreography that's already established, been around for a few years um, and um, by the Helios Dance Company in LA. It's set to David Bowie's uh, iconic song, Heroes. Uh, for those of you that are as old as I am, you remember, remember that. Um, and um, it is, it's an intimate duet. And what we're trying to do is um, invite people into experiencing that duet in a way that you would never be able to do that in a theater setting or in a, in a, in a traditional um, performance art setting where we're on stage and you might be pretty far away from that dance. You never get the chance to experience that close up. So the question we asked. Uh, was how can we use uh, the evolution of media and of immersive media to bring the story that is the narrative story that is in dance closer and how can we uh, get people more in touch with their body and who they are and where they are at the point that they're experiencing it. So there's three parts to the hero's experience and I'm only really going to talk about the HoloLens piece because I was not as involved with the other two parts. Uh, the first part I don't have a video, I don't have an image of but the first part is uh, just a 2D film, so just a, um, not saying just as if it's less, but a film, <laughs> 2D. Uh, the next is a 360 video experience, I'll show a little bit of that, which is photo reel using a Nokia Ozo camera, and the last is mixed reality. And that's how we have the audience go through it. So they would first see an impression of the dance on a, just on the screen, a regular screen. Um, then they would see, they would be immersed and next to the dancers on stage um, as the dance is progressing. And then lastly, they would enter a room and have their own intimate experience with the dance through mixed reality. Again, we're gonna focus on the mixed reality part, but I want to, the idea is that there's three things. Um, I did not do this on my own. I really was uh, the enabler around the HoloLens and helping understand the constraints and what was possible within the short timeline. Um, and I worked with Quinn Kennedy, who's right here. Um, and he helped uh, also on the HoloLens piece. 
Um, and Melissa Painter from MAP Design Lab, she's the instigator and the artist behind the project. Um, and a lot of the production, um, that the, the art production was done and the vision and the 360 part was done by NPC VR. NPC is owned by Technicolor, it's one of the largest um, visual effects companies in the world. Um, and Tim Dillon runs that team in LA. So they were, they were crucial in the photogrammetry and in uh, providing a lot of production support for this experience. So it takes a, takes a village, right? I wanted to highlight that. Um, I also wanted to highlight that we built it in Unity and Unity is a supporter of this project. So this is a made uh, for Unity, uh, made with Unity uh, project and um, was highlighted as part of that. So here is a duet of mixed reality. Let's talk, let's look at a bit of the, just the 2D footage here. So this is, um, <laughs> that's David Bowie. Um, this is a piece of the dance. This is just showing um, the, uh, some of the, um, the dance rehearsals and trying to rehearse and figure out how to use the stage. And so it's a very physical, uh, 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 balanced uh, dance between uh, the two partners in the dance. It's heroic in a way as to what they are physically able to do. Um, that piece uh, was translated into a VR piece. And that VR piece is available for Gear VR on the Oculus Rift store. So if you have a Gear VR, uh, you can go on. It's available for free. Um, it is only Gear VR, but uh, download it and have that experience. I unfortunately don't have a Gear VR myself, or actually I have a Gear VR, I have the headset, I don't have an Android phone. Uh, but by all means, give that a go. Um, it is truly an immersive and wonderful experience as to how they worked with the 3D, um, the 360 and the 3D elements. And I'm going to show a little bit of the video of that, because it's important to understand the 360 to give context for what we did in mixed reality. So this is showing shots uh, that were integrated into the 360 piece. It's not showing it as 360 right here. And this was recorded in the Ace Hotel Theater, the theater, the Ace Theater in LA, um, which is uh, which was built in the 20s by Charlie Chaplin, and it's the Universal Artist Theater. So that's what it started at. It was recently uh, renovated. Um, it's a neo-Gothic uh, you know, temple to film in a way. It was built for silent film, and so for us it was great to have the support from the Ace Hotel um, to be able to use their uh, their stage and the whole environment and to set this dance within that. And you'll see this come back um, in the mixed reality because we used photogrammetry from the theater to give space to the dancers to dance in, uh, in mixed reality. Um, and once you go through the experience, you'll, you'll see that the, 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 uh, the motion capture that we have in the mixed reality is, is, the, is the same dance. So the choreography was not adjusted or changed specifically for mixed reality. We're taking an existing uh, piece, an existing narrative, and we're finding, how, we're finding out ways to engage with that narrative through mixed reality. And then the final piece um, was the HoloLens piece, um, mixed reality. And um, I'm gonna just show a quick walkthrough of that um, and not, uh, I'm, I'm not really gonna do a live stream of it because I think afterwards, uh, anybody who wants to see it can come and look at it. Um, this is a recording of uh, what Dwayne saw at the, uh, 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 the Vision Conference in, uh, in May. And so what you're seeing um, is me walking through the experience um, and as I walk and get closer to different pieces and I kind of cut this together um, I can unlock different dances and I can use commands to grow the dancers um, and to unlock the different experiences so the whole idea here is to get people to move into the space and to own being present in the space they're in and digital often removes us from being present and from being where we are um, and the, the idea of this project was really to bring it together also, as you walk, you leave your trail. So we're creating an opportunity for somebody to feel the presence and to see an effect that they're leaving. So it's not just looking at it. Um, by moving around, you're actually contributing to the dance and to the experience. That's that ribbon you're just seeing. Right? That's the, the ribbon you're seeing right there. And then the final, uh, the final piece, um, we went through quite some effort to, to do a palm detection. And as you all know, if anybody's worked with the HoloLens, you can't actually detect palms. You can only detect your finger. And um, 
we, we really wanted to not have the dancers on your finger just because it didn't make any sense from a storytelling perspective to have dancers dangling on your finger. So we went through an effort of, and I'll try to show some of this, of using an external, uh, of mixing uh, inside out and outside in tracking or recall. We used to connect si a, a network with the HoloLens to basically figure out where your palm was. Um, and then we use that to figure out in the HoloLens where to put the dancer. So the idea is in the end, uh, you'll see that the dancer's on the palm of your hand. Mm. So that kind of gives you guys an, an overview of the experience, of the, the, the mixed reality experience. So why do we do this? I kind of touched on this earlier, but modern media disregards the body and plays out movement and presence. Uh, we are often, uh, you know, couch potatoes is a, is, is a way to think about that or where that comes from. Um, we're, we're removed, um, we're, we're, we're not moving, we're not engaged, we move less and less. Um, so how can we find ways to connect modern audiences to the here and now, to be present, to be more present? And one way to do that is through movement. Um, if you're in sports or if you're in dance, um, you'll, that is really a, a way to create, um, um, to create more of a connection with now. Find new ways for audiences to experience dance. Uh, dance is, is currently um, more of an elite or it's hard, it's not as accessible as some of the other performance art forms. Um, so how can we, is there an opportunity to change the way that people experience and think about dance and motion uh, and uh, bodies in motion? And dance is all about presence and motion. And so that's kind of where, where we end up with this project. And that's kind of the why, the thinking behind this. So how can we use evolution of virtual and augmented reality experience to here and now? That's kind of like a large, uh, you know, big question. There's a lot of answers to that. But that's what we're trying to solve. And that's kind of the art. Um, and the, the, you know, the inquiry, if you want to put it, the, the question that we're trying to achieve here. Um, and our answer is by getting the, the audience to move and speak and engage with the space. So you can't, this is not something that you can just walk in and go like, ooh, wow, and then walk away. You have to move to make the next thing happen. You have to talk, you have to speak, you have to be present for this experience to work. Um, and for me, the big eye opener, or yeah, for me, I guess I can say the big eye opener was choreography and the idea of choreography and what that means. Uh, which is uh, the way I interpret this, the art of placing things over time. And when we start thinking about mixed reality um, and in designing for mixed reality and what we're doing, that's in essence what we're doing. Uh, we're placing things um, in place, in physical space, over time, and that's how you can create a narrative. There's a lot of opportunity there. Here's a, an image of the, uh, the space that we built. Um, so we built a custom space um, for, for a few reasons. One is we wanted this to be a somewhat because it's an intimate dance, we wanted this to be a, a, con a contemplative thing, not something that you have a lot of people looking at you doing it, but something that you can just be in on your own in the world, and it's, it's magic, it kind of lifts that up. And so that's why we built a special room um, with a door that closed and that you could go in and have the experience. Um, and this, these are images of what we created. Um, for those of you that have done uh, HoloLens in different spaces, um, HoloLens does not like black walls or featureless mm -hmm. spaces. Um, and so we went through some effort to put ribbons in the space, and um, I can bore you with the details about that later. But the effect was, was wonderful. The people that we're bringing, in, we're bringing in, the actors, the film directors, and the people in the industry, um, were really touched by the experience, and I feel like we're able to get a very emotive, uh, moving away from the tech, moving away from, I'm wearing a Hollands on my head, but really like thinking about, hey, what does it mean if we can start playing this holographic? What does that mean for narrative and for the way that we tell stories? Um, if we can design spaces and augmented reality together. And we had people lie down, and people cry, we had people laugh. And, um, yeah, it was, it was amazing to see the response. For most of the people here, um, this, they had never worn a HoloLens or had an experience like this. And so that's another thing to think of. Uh, currently, we're still in that phase, which is a wonderful phase to be exploring in because you can you get more of a raw, you get a more of a childlike reaction because we haven't gone through uh, a cultural adjustment or society hasn't really adjusted to an expectation setting around the HoloLens. Um, and that allows you to do things that um, maybe five years from now we won't be as special or people won't really uh, connect with as much because they think it's weird. Right now, nobody's defined what is weird. And so everybody's kind of open to wanting to do something. And um, I think that that's what really worked well for this project. Um, so here's a here's an idea, a sense of the uh, of the. This is in SketchUp. We had to figure out like how big is this space and where are we going to place all the different elements um, and how do we can communicate that back and forth. And so you can see these numbers: one, um, two, three, four, five. It's, it's not a, it's not a good screen ca capture. But uh, earlier this 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 evening, I was kind of placing the objects. So one of the things that you have to do as you go into this space is calibrate towards that space. 
and figure out uh, you know, where, for this space, where is a good place to, to place these objects? How do I create the choreography that makes sense within the space? And so we did something quickly today. I didn't, uh, didn't really think hard about it because I didn't have much time. But um, yeah, if you think about that more and if you have the opportunity to prepare a space for, and you can put furniture in there and you can uh, start playing with how people walk through it and you can start changing the night lighting dynamically based on what the HoloLens is doing, you can start imagining a uh, very immersive theatrical experience that is augmented through mixed reality. That's, that's where you know, I'd like to take it if we could. Mm -hmm. um, this, is, uh, this is a crown right here. It's one of the crowns that we 3D printed. Um, and so what we're trying to do here is also remove the stigma, or not stigma, but people that are not tech and that are not in tech might have an aversion or might have, it's a, it's a higher uh, threshold to get involved in it. They're like, well, that's a tech thing. Tech doesn't work for me. That's totally not my thing. Um, and so we're trying to figure out, like, how do we remove uh, the tech demo aspect of this? And say, like, look at the new tech, but more like, no, we have this, we have a magical experience that we want you to step into. And so the way that you bring this forward, the way that you bring the HoloLens to somebody and say, like, what are you going to do with it, um, changes managing expectations as to what they're going to do. I think often we just, VR similarly, we're just like, here, put it on. And people are like, well, I don't know, you know? And so how can you be sensitive to, towards that? How can you help somebody kind of move into it? And for us, it was putting the crown on so people wouldn't focus as much on the device and they would open up and be like, yeah, I'll, you know, I'll dress up or that's a prop, I'll take that prop. And you can even start, you kind of subliminally are saying, you know, without this prop, it doesn't work. You have to do this. Um, versus if it's just a piece of tech, it's a bit different. So simple, um, if you want the 3D model to do this, I can share that with you. <laughs> because we had to get the exact curvature all that. It was fun. So kind of a summary before I go into like, how do we do this and how do we go about it, um, is that holographic experiences come to life in the environment they play in are aware of them. And I think that um, we're, right now, uh, a lot of the, the work that we're doing is like we're putting things you know, on the desk and that's it. But the, the, the desk was not designed for that hologram to stick on it. Um, and the environment was not. And I think it's a challenge to us as holographic programmers or whatever you call us, mixed reality programmers or mixed reality designers to start thinking about um, what does the physical space look like? What am I doing in physical space that is in dialogue with and what's the dialogue between you know, the holograms that I'm building and what's happening? RoboRaid is a good example of that where it's doing uh, scanning of the walls, right? And it's thinking about that. It's like, okay, let me think about the space. And then based on that space, I'm gonna tell a story. And I think that's a really good example of, uh, of somebody that, of a team that has thought through the holistically, what should this be, instead of just putting something in space. For example, that holographic transmission just floats there and it means nothing unless you actually physically have the transmission parts underneath it, right? So those, those two are in dialogue, they're together. It doesn't work, it's not a good demo if you're not seeing the actual physical parts. And then the other part is uh, mixing the physical interaction into holographic experiences gives a whole new meaning to the term mixed reality. And what I mean with this is um, we're kind of fixated on inside out tracking right now, meaning it's all my head and me and this is it. But um, if you can, uh, using a connect or using other sensors, if the space can be more aware of what you're doing or if the HoloLens and your phone can be in conversation with each other. So again, the HoloLens, it's poor, uh, I think it's a poor text reading environment. There's things that you don't do on a HoloLens that it doesn't work well, but it could be on your phone. And so if you have a device or if you have screens in a room, how could you have those screens and the HoloLens experience have a conversation with each other? Or if I would just put five trackers on everything um, and I would move those physical objects, I could have holographic objects that go with that. Vuforia is a good example. If I use Vuforia tags or Vuforia object recognition, I could recognize a physical object like this and have a holographic translation on it. So we're not only creating things that are ethereal in the air, but they actually have a relationship with the physical. And um, that's what we found with the, the whole, like, get the thing to be on your palm, which you're like, really? And we spent quite a lot of time, Quinn can tell you, on trying to get that to work well. And it doesn't actually work very well right now. It's a, it's a pilot thing. I wouldn't recommend doing it that approach. But I, it did show me uh, that it's a visceral experience when you can get these things to work together, when you can get that connection. So my call to action for you guys is to think about uh, what's the physical space that you're putting it in and what can you do to that physical space or how can you augment or do something with that space to make the holograms feel like they belong. And that's how architects and interior designers and uh, industrial designers think about the worlds that, and the products that they make. And we can learn from that. We can bring that into our uh, engineering and, and design practice. 
So the, the, uh, the challenges were many and varied. Um, the biggest one was budget, which was non-existent, and schedule, which was very short. Um, and so uh, that really informed a lot of uh, the, the choices that we had to make about this. And, um, and I love that question, it's like, what would you do different or how would you go next? And, and we can talk about that later. Um, another challenge is the limited gesture tracking in the HoloLens. Um, it works well um, if you have a moment. It's a threshold, right? You have to take five to 10 minutes to learn how to do that and to become comfortable with that. Um, and that works if you're going to provide a productivity app afterwards. If you're going to give something that's going to be two hours worth of fun, like in RoboRate or like a lot of hours of fun, then you're like, okay, I'll learn that for five minutes. But if you're in a public setting or what we're doing, and it's a five minute experience in total, having teaching somebody who's never gone through the HoloLens to do this, <laughs> it's not going to work. It just, it breaks the whole project. It breaks the whole narrative. It breaks the magic of it. And it, ho it really focuses on you've got tech and you've got to learn how to deal with that tech. So it is, which is, that's I'm not a critique on my part, it's just it doesn't work within, if you're trying to create a narrative experience. Um, there's, there's a hard way, it's hard to bring people into that. Um, and so that's why we had to move away from that, and that was kind of like our biggest figuring out, like how do we not use tracking and hand and stuff like that, because we, we can't go through the process of people learning that. And my experience demoing it to many people, because I've demoed on the other side a lot, um, is that a lot of people feel like a failure when it doesn't work. And that's exactly not what you want to give somebody when you're trying to create an experience like this. You're trying to give them something that's uplifting and that's contempt that, that is emotional and that they can connect with. And failure is typically not uh, what we're looking for in performance art that way. Um, managing the experience for the audience um, is, um, so if you are on the exhibit floor, I don't know how many of you guys have actually put these out and like demoed them and, and pulled the people through, but it's something you want to think carefully about. If you ever seen Microsoft do it, they have a really slick operation as to how they go about, and they have like 50 HoloLenses and a whole team that kind of works through this, and they really thought about the logistics of how to make this a positive experience for their audience, and then how to facilitate all the things that you need to do with that. So for us, that was a challenge uh, because there's just six of us, and Sundance is for two weeks, so we really had to figure out as to like, how could we, what could we do to make this feel better or work better and, and let, take the guesswork out. And uh, we needed to know what the audience was seeing. And so, because this was the first experience for a lot of people, they didn't know how to talk about what they, you know, like, so is it going, like, where's it at? Where's the app? Is it doing what it's, but I don't know, I can't see, right? So you can only guess, you can kind of like try and listen in on what they're doing, but uh, that's a challenge. Um, and we needed to know the battery state and all these things. So one of the, one of the challenges we, that we foresaw, because we had to run it for two weeks, uh, 10 to 12 hours a day, was like, how do we, you know, how do we not, uh, how do we know that it's actually doing what it's supposed to be doing? Those were our challenges. Um, so how we built this? Um, we, we built this in three components. So there's three, par <coughs> three parts, three separate efforts. <coughs> there's the HoloLens app, which runs on the HoloLens, which is a Unity application. Um, and it uses primarily uh, the, the, the really, um, it uses uh, uh, Unity networking, so it doesn't use any sh of the shared HoloLens, but it uses the Uni Unity networking app, uh, API to talk with the Connect server app. And so the Connect server and the HoloLens need to be registered to the same space. I'll show that a bit later. Um, and then we had a mobile device management app, which I'll just touch on a little bit. Um, and Microsoft it basically uses every HoloLens has a RESTful API that you can introspect to find out what its temperature profile, where it's at with the temperature, where it's at with the battery and what app is running. So kind of like you know how you would remotely manage or look at uh, managing PCs, you can uh, do a lot of that with uh, HoloLenses too, which is a, uh, robust and I, uh, uh, was really kind of a lifesaver for us in the, in the project. So this is a quick view on Unity, um, talking about how I built it in Unity is a whole different uh, conversation. But, uh, and I'll, I will touch on just the general flow of how we got stuff in. And then if you have specifics, I, I have the project here, I can kind of show you how we architected it. Though I wouldn't, given the timeline that we had, I wouldn't recommend this is doing the way we did it. But I would recommend doing it in Unity. I think Unity really was an enabler for this project. I don't know how else uh, we would have been able to pull it. So let's, let's talk about external tracking and try and do a live demo. Um, and Quinn's going to help with this one. So what you're seeing here uh, behind the scenes um, is um, 
is the behind the scenes of the, of the exhibit. It's starting to find it. Okay. Yeah. 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 We're not showing what, uh, what Quinn is seeing, but I will show this piece. So what are we looking at? Um, we're looking at uh, Quinn, if you can walk this way. You guys can see uh, Quinn is over here. Um, that's the HoloLens on his head. And as he moves his head, um, we can track the HoloLens in space. So what we've done is we've built a uh, collaboration between the Kinect world, the way the Kinect sees the world, and the way the HoloLens uh, sees the world. And the way we're doing that is we placed a world anchor where the Kinect is. So by, having, by using world anchors and using inverse transforms, that's how you can create uh, these shared worldviews. When you create a shared, uh, to the question earlier, when you create a shared uh, space between multiple HoloLenses, that's what you're doing too. You have to find a ground truth. Everybody needs to know a specific thing, which is a world anchor is a great way to go, um, if, as long as it's a stable world anchor, um, to get going. And then um, what you're seeing, these boxes um, are basically hotspot areas um, that if, uh, um, if you hold your hand out, you can see, and this is not a great visualization, but you can see that little plate that is on Quinn's uh, hand from the top. See the little square? Um, that's basically his palm. And so what we'll do is we'll sync that palm through, uh, through the UNET, the Unity Networking API. You can synchronize game objects. And you're, it's not like we're sending connect data to the HoloLens. All we're doing is we're sending and synchronizing the state of that game object, that little block, to the HoloLens, and then the HoloLens can place the dancers on where that block is. So that's how that uh, works. That's slightly technical, but that's um, that's how we were able to achieve it. Um, yeah, that's that's how that works. Um, the uh, we had to do multiple HoloLens things so that it knew which one to track and all that type of stuff. But yeah, it kind of gives you an idea of once you can start tracking on multiple levels, not just relying on the internal tracking capabilities of the HoloLens, but you can combine that with external tracking through a Vive track or through Connects or through what have you, different uh, computer vision ways of doing that. Um, it kind of starts opening up the type of experiences that you can build. Um, and those experiences will be more natural to us than just only pure the holographic experiences. And that's, the, that's why I'm trying to show you guys this, is to kind of give you guys a, a mindset as to like, it could be a bit bigger uh, than what we have. And so that's another box. Thank you, Quinn. Yeah. So that's the external part tracking part. Uh, device management, we're using, uh, we're basically inspired by the HoloLens. Yeah, all right, I'm not going to load that up, but there's a HoloLens companion toolkit, uh, which if you haven't looked at, I would highly recommend looking at it. And this is Microsoft releasing the learnings that they have done from like, at least this is my understanding of it is that the stuff that they learned of doing trade shows, they're slowly releasing some of that stuff to open source and you can use it. So you can see how they are managing their devices, how they are doing IPD, because we're not doing IPD adjustment, but they have a system for doing that. And it also starts to show you how to integrate with the device portal. Um, the device portal that is on the HoloLens is the same device portal that, for those of you that did uh, Windows Phone development, it's a similar API, it's a similar approach. Um, and so you can also look at that documentation and examples for that to kind of boot you up on that. But we built it all in Unity, uh, just using simple Unity UI elements and C-sharp in the background. It doesn't have to be in Unity. You could build it in, in, uh, just in Xamarin straight up if that's easier for you. Um, but it worked well, and we were able to see which device, uh, which device is connected to the Connect server, so which ones are active. 
um, we're able to see where it was, where it thought it was, right? So we could see if for some reason the HoloLens, because we're in a dark space and sometimes a lot of people come in, would lose its track, we would see that behind the scenes. We'd see the whole world shift. And we'd be like, all right. And then we'd be able to go in and just go like, hey, you know, show's over or we got to replace the HoloLens. So it was a way for us to kind of <clears throat> know what were people, if people were seeing the right thing or not. By looking at that Connect uh, registration, uh, we could we could get an idea, um, and we look at battery state, so we knew how, when when it was dropping down. I mean, you can look at the dots, but it's hard. And like is that when you're demoing, you're not looking at those dots necessarily. So <clears throat> it was another way to look at that. And then finally, um, you could look at the state that the application thought it was in. So we were also syncing just a simple state management, um, so we could see you know which state uh, it was in, which scene in essence it was playing. So how do we get um, the, the art in there, or how do we, you know, what was the asset creation pipeline uh, like? The um, motion capture was a new thing for me. I mean, I've done a lot of work with Connect and depth sensing and and, uh, and uh, depth clouds, basically, <clears throat> but I hadn't really done much. And the skeletal stuff that the Connect does, uh, as limited as it is, can can be useful. The um, but I'd never really done like the full on like mocap, like you see visual effects and like what they use um, in uh, in the visual effects industry. Um, so that was a boot up for me, and also within Unity, the whole avatar design and, and skinning and mesh skinning, all that stuff was all new. Um, but we used a Vicon motion capture stage, um, which is uses a whole bunch of uh, cameras looking at uh, the dancers and the dancers with all these dots on them, and it does all the magic. Um, and it gets and then through and then that goes into Motion Builder uh, once it's processed, and you can cut it up or do basically all the editing that you would do, like you would do editing uh, in Final Cut with video, Motion Builder, uh, in this case was used similarly to edit the specific sets that we wanted. Um, and then we exported that as an FBX to Unity. Uh, the avatar design, and we're using avatar here as a word, it's probably not the right term, the character design. So what did those dancers look like? Each scene that we had, each fragment, had a different look. Uh, the dancers looked differently. They had a different skin, and um, they actually had uh, different skeletons too in some, in some of the cases. Um, so, <clears throat> um, we used ZBrush to create the textures uh, to, for some of them. We actually did uh, 3D scans of the dancers too in the later scenes. Um, so we used uh, just a rapid scan like you would with the Kinect, you know, you can scan 3D objects. And then we had to uh, go into, I think we used Maya to read, read to apologize that so that it could be worked with the, uh, uh, with the, with the character and the rig. So. You'll see my, one of my learnings is about motion capture, and you should leave that to the pros. Um, game design assets and shaders, uh, we use the Uni particle system a lot, and then ShaderForge uh, to create some of the visuals. Um, uh, and I didn't use that, but that was a great way to bring uh, some design elements in, because my background isn't in design, it's in technology. And finally, the photogrammetry, um, that was done with PhotoScan. Um, there's many tools that you can use for that. Um, one thing to know about photogrammetry is that it generates very complex uh, models. The 3D models you get out really need to be cleaned up and simplified down for it to work uh, well within Unity. Uh, not Unity, to work well on the HoloLens. Luckily, the, those models are static from a, from a lighting perspective, so we baked all the lighting. So we were able to get a pretty um, decent, it's not decent, we got 30 frames per second, we're supposed to get 60, uh, but I was surprised that getting 30 frames per second given the amount of time we had for doing a performance uh, tweaking at the end. And then exhibiting, a, I highlighted some of this, each fragment is a world anchor. So um, as I was showing earlier, as you enter and you see them up there, or you see them on the floor, you see somewhere else, each, each that's a scene in Unity, each scene is anchored by a world anchor uh, in the place. So I can come here and set it up really easily. I can go to Sundance and set it up. I can go to yeah, uh, Unity Vision, the Vision Conference. I think we're at SIGGRAPH this year at the VR Village. Actually going in and setting up the space for this experience, local to that space is uh, like a five minute process. So it's very easy to do and very quick. Um, and I was inspired by how the Holograms app work. Right? Basically, you, know, you, you look at it and you just, oh, I want it there or I want it there. So it's a similar, uh, similar process. Um, so device management, uh, we had six uh, rotating hall lenses through, and we were using the, the custom Unity Android app to monitor where those were at. Um, and we were able to, we were using one person 
so we're, we're putting one HoloLens through at what point, at what time. And that worked with six. I think we could have done it with four, maybe, um, and still got the charge cycle going. So the challenge is they deplete faster. HoloLenses deplete faster. The battery depletes faster than that charges. So for you to charge, it could take, I forget what we came up with, but it could take, I think, three or four hours to charge. But we'd run them down in two hours. And so you, at some point, at the end of the day, you don't have any HoloLenses left. Um, so you need to have extra ones and start rotating that in and out. Uh, and our calculation was for two, to have a reliable um, system with two people going through the HoloLens at the same time, you would need, um, uh, you would, you'd need six. That's how we end up six and three, nine. So that's kind of how we figured it out. And then the spatial design, and I don't know what to say about this. It's, it's, a, it's a challenge. Um, uh, uh, I think I have the impression that the um, mixed reality um, algorithms that we have in the HoloLens and, and how it tracks and hooks onto space um, and basically its spatial design is optimized for office settings. Wouldn't surprise me if that's the case. And so if you step out of an office setting where there's not as many lines and it's not as cluttered as you can see in an office space, um, it does start to degrade and it's hard to predict when it's gonna degrade and it's hard to know why it degraded when it did degrade. And so um, you just need to build like three days in for that to figure out like how can we make this space more interesting from a visual? How could you make it visually more interesting for the HoloLens to like grab onto stuff? But the way I think about it is it needs patterns and lines and edges, as I understand computer vision, and have an idea of how they're trying to figure this out, uh, and it needs contrast. And so if you can build a contrastful environment that has that, that's great. So if you're thinking, I'm gonna do a HoloLens art piece in a white gallery, it's not gonna work well, um, unless you put a lot of lines all over the place, and then it will have you know, be able to grab onto that. So there's a, an aesthetic challenge uh, when you're working with an interior designer about this. Similarly, if, it's, uh, if you're using a lot of gauze, it will go straight through that. So it won't capture the gauze as a, uh, um, it, it, if it's not solid enough, it won't capture it well as a, as a, um, as a solid object. So there's things that you need to think through. Um, there's a, you can't make the assumptions that because it worked at your desk or at your home or in your office, that it's gonna work uh, within the physical space that you're putting it in. Um, and it's important to, to think about. Um, so learnings, uh, exhibiting a Holland's experience requires a lot of hand-holding on the floor and on the floor manpower. Um, this is because um, it's the device, um, um, though it's, it's great, um, it does take a while for people to get used to, especially if they haven't ever worn one, they don't know what to expect. So it's like giving somebody a phone and say go, or giving somebody a Vive headset and say go. Um, and there's a lot of like managing expectations. Well, what you should see is this thing. And they're like, it's getting cut off. You're like, no, that's the field of view, right? And so like there's, and then, you know, so everybody has a slightly different way of thinking about it and all our heads are shaped differently. So it's a very challenging uh, situation with something the way that the HoloLens had to be designed to be able to get it to fit well for everybody. So you can't just give somebody a HoloLens and go, you have to, work with them and you want to be sensitive to the fact that they're basically babies you, they've never done any of this like this before and you don't want to get to that point where they feel like a failure they're like well this technology doesn't work for me so um, we have uh, a lot of volunteers you know think about that you know think about how does that work within your script if you're doing uh, this stuff and how do you talk to people and kind of script that through motion surprising surprise motion captures a whole discipline unto itself find an expert uh, if you want quality results it's very hard to get good results on your own um, shouldn't be a surprise to many people. Um, but it really, it caught me off guard as to how complex that was. And it also gave me a whole new uh, respect, big respect uh, for what we're seeing in visual effects and what they're able to achieve with that. There's a, there's a really a group of uh, experts that uh, go after that. And designing an environment for reliable tracking is an inexact science, or it's an art in itself. So maybe that can be a specialty for people. So that, yeah, that's kind of uh, where where I wanted to open it up to questions and see if anybody had any questions or anything I could go deeper on. Can you go back to the Unity graphics slide? Please, everyone, I'd like you to raise your hand and uh, take the mic before you ask a question so the people at home can hear. What kind of plugins is available right now for the Unity, for the HoloLens? Uh, so you can use uh, the Holo Toolkit, uh, which is uh, released by Microsoft uh, in I think in partnership with Unity, they work together. Um, it's called Holo Toolkit. It's on GitHub. It's an open source project, um, and it will. Um, uh, it basically 
uh, is a wrapper around the base APIs uh, that you have access to. Um, it makes life easy. Um, it can be, um, I haven't looked at it in a while, um, so I'm, I'm not sure what the status of it is, but when I was working with it, also when I was doing the holographic transmission, it was in rapid development. Um, and so it can be challenging at points to understand exactly where it's at and what it's doing, but I think it's just a matter of time for that to, to start. I think also, uh, just as I'm discovering things, I'm sure Microsoft and Unity are discovering things, uh, paradigms and design patterns that they want to uh, evolve. Um, for example, the, the user gesture system is very different from what I from the basic one that I worked with. Um, so yeah, I would really recommend the Holo Toolkit. Yeah, it's a it's a great, a great place to start. It comes with examples, and so those examples really get you going. So look, yeah, yeah. I, you had mentioned that one of the aspects of dance is that it's often the performers are far away. And I'm wondering, within your experience, what was the presentation scale of the performers at any one time? It, always, it looked, at least in the screen, yeah. as if it was always sort of smaller holograms that they were looking at. Was there anything where you really got the experience of being right up with the dancers the way you might have in the VR experience? Yes, you, you can do that. Uh, the challenge is the field of view. Um, so you would end up just seeing a piece of their body. So it, it, it ended up being the reason why, so uh, in, in the second scene, you can make them larger. So by, by saying the voice command larger, they will grow. And they will grow uh, to like twice human scale. So you can make them very large and experience that. The, 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 and that was fine. People love doing that. The challenge with it is, because um, uh, the field of view is basically this much, and that's what you're looking at, that quickly, if you're close up to a dancer, um, you're really not seeing the dance. So that is why we had to go with um, small dancers and small scale, um, was so that people could see the full choreography of it. I don't know if that, how that answers yeah, your question. Yeah, sort of, so when you're making them grow, you're then seeing them grow within the space, but you're still seeing the full dancer? Yeah, you're seeing the full dancer, and if you, would fall, if you walk far enough away, you would see them. But it's a, it's a field of view challenge within the HoloLens. Um, to, to be because it just doesn't have that the height you know it doesn't the the, the, the frustrum of the camera in essence doesn't allow you to see uh, you know a person one feet away all the way through you would only see their head um, and so that was that was really uh, that is what that was one of the guiding things that we did in this is uh, all the pieces when they spawn they spawn far away from you so you first see it in the in the hole so you see the dancers fully they're never cut off the dance is never cut off and then you choose to walk towards that um, and engage with it and by that by doing it that way um, it's kind of how you focus your mind like if it's a dirty window we don't look at the dirty window we look through the window right we don't look at the dirt on the window it's the same in my experience with the hololens is if you create a scene that really highlights that there's a field of view right first the first thing that you see is like oh it's cut off um, then people will complain about it. But if you create something further away and they don't see the cutoff and they start looking and then they walk towards it, their eye is on the object. Their, their mind's eye is on the object and they're not noticing it getting cut off as much. And so that was the, that was the trick or the design um, that we used. We're also really trying to get curiosity and get people to lean in and move, kind of like a diorama, uh, the di diorama would do. or. Um, like a viewfinder or something, people like looking, you know, like a, if there's a hole in the wall, someone will look through it. Um, so like trying to get that curiosity and get people to want to play and go through that. And I feel like that's a very effective way to get people to like get a move away from that field of view and engage in the actual hologram that you're showing. Next question. Anyone? I'll ask a non-technical question. So what kind of feedback did you get from the dancers? They loved it. Yeah, they thought um, they loved seeing themselves <laughs> um, in that way. So in their, uh, in the, um, they were, okay, I'll give you the honest answer here. The, the, the uh, motion capture is terrible with feet. So in general, motion capture technology has not gotten to the point where we can track feet accurately because feet's on the floor, and so if you're using external tracking, where, what is the floor and what is the foot from a computer vision problem, uh, perspective is really difficult. And for dance, that your ha hands are we, we're better at, but feet and the arch of the foot 
is a, is a complete piece of the dance that they're doing and of the, 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 what you should be seeing. And so we weren't able to get the feet in. So they all said the feet suck. <laughs> <laughs> and that's true. I mean, to you and I, if you're not a, if you're not trained towards that, or if you're not sensitive towards that, uh, you wouldn't notice it. And we chose the less egregious scenes, right? But we had to get rid of a bunch of them because we couldn't get the feet right. Now, with more time, and the way that they saw this in visual effects, is you go in and hand animate those feet, right? And you can do that. Um, and you can, I mean, there's no reason why you can't get that skeleton to do exactly what it needs to do. But within the context of what we're doing, and it's like an art pilot piece, um, but in general, they really liked it. And uh, uh, in, for me, the general feedback every, every, for, for most, the vast majority of people was delight. People were just delighted by it. They just thought it was the cutest thing or the funnest thing or the happiest thing that they saw. So that was the, the feedback that we got. And I feel like, yeah, it's about small and it's about just the magic and the surprise of it. Okay. Thanks. Other questions? Yeah, another question is that <clears throat> the, was the dance, was the, so the dance is synchronized to the music, was that persistent through, what did the song start when they entered, and then they wandered around through yeah, the experience yeah. and found the dance in progress when they got it to each element, or did that element then restart things, or how did that work? We mixed it in, so we, um, so you, it's not like you're listening to the whole song, from start to end and that they're dancing to that it's recognizable pieces of the song um so people recognize it but it's not the full uh the full song that they're dancing to in the hololens because we wanted people to have time with these things and the, the challenge is you don't want to rush somebody through it and the, the song is like a four minute song i think something like that so it, um and the arc of the song is different of the dan you know and all that so what we're trying to do um is each fragment as you go from one fragment to the other the the audio changes and we're using audio uh, to actually help people find where to look next. So when you're looking over there, um, you'll, hear a, you'll hear a ping or something that will be like, oh, it's over there. And then you'll hear the audio. And then when you look closer, so as you move, uh, we're using 3D audio and the spatialized audio capabilities of Unity to be able to, sh to let people know where to look. And so that's what we're using. Um, and the song, yeah, the song at point, there's parts, some parts of the dance that don't have um, that actually don't have uh, David Bowie's song underneath it, and other parts of the fragments um, that have it very obviously. And audio is a big deal. So if you can find a spatialized, somebody that knows how to do audio and spatialized audio, similarly as uh, motion tracking, um, it, is a, uh, it, is, it can really make a space. It can really give you a sense of, uh, of the size of something and the scale of something. Yeah, um, back to the dancers. And did any of them see it, see any value in this as kind of a training thing, where they could they see themselves dancing and then like, gee, I, could, I need to improve this, or you know, that's a good. It's a good. Not that didn't come up. I know that uh, I know that there's other project dance projects that are thinking about it in this way. Uh, it's actually helpful for the choreographer more. Um, I mean. Yeah, it's it both, the collaboration, but the choreographers, it's very helpful for them to be able to block out uh, and just to understand um, how this could be or how this could be different. Uh, and with dancers, uh, you know, the, really the challenge of HoloLens is the field of view. <laughs> um, and so I guess if I'm standing here and you're over there and we're dancing a duet very far away from each other, that might work, where I could, t I could, um, uh, I could, practice with somebody that's not there that's a way to think about it uh, but in general that's not they did like critiquing I mean I think but I think they're critical people so like I mean they're professionals right so they're going to be critical of their own performance and so they thought it was really interesting to look at um, little pieces of themselves and they're like you know, they just with video you never are never able to look at it from that different angle and I, that, that was I feel like uh, what they really was intriguing to them thank you that one more quickie on the on the uh, David Bowie song, did you have to pay for that? Yes, yeah. handsomely, yeah. You did? Yeah, we did. Yeah. sponsors. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Tom. Uh, I have to say the sponsor now, Oculus sponsored that. Uh, our Oculus and Unity were the, were the main sponsors and helped with that. Yeah. Questions? Next question. Uh, as a movement artist, I relate to a lot of what you said in the desire to create an experience that people could relate to or an opportunity for people to relate to dance 
Uh, there are so many different movement practices to play with in this environment. It's exciting to see, and I think that um, uh, Buto is one of these dance movements that happens really slowly, but it's really uh, unique in the movements. And so <laughs> I'm just excited and appreciate the effort that you put into this to further develop an ability to connect movement artists with those who are interested in feeling the experience, but maybe aren't gifted with the like physical ability to have those experiences. Cool. Yeah, thank you. So just thank you. Yeah, thank you. Any more questions or feedback? Okay. Um, cool. Thank you. Obviously, everyone, uh, both Sean and Thomas and crew, will be available for more questions uh, when we break into social time. I'm going to flip back to slides for just a couple minutes because I want to give away some prizes and I just want to give some recognition to a couple of our sponsors quickly. One second here. Thank you. Thank you. So as I do each month, uh, I'm going to point out the member discount page. I see some new faces in the audience. We have a special page on the Winhugger site that you have to be a Winhugger member, signed up member to go see. Uh, on there, there are a lot of great discounts from all of our different uh, publishing partners, or most of our publishing partners. There are also uh, event. Uh, I'm not quite sure why I'm still showing Vision Summit. It's over. But there are events from time to time. I think the most recent event is the O'Reilly uh, event that's coming up on uh, AI in September. So significant discounts if you're going to those conferences, if you're buying any books, uh, please check out this page. There are discounts that are worth your while. Um, our sponsors in general are Unity, the Microsoft HoloLens team. Uh, they help us provide or to put on these meetings each month. Um, the creative group has come on uh, as of last month and looks like they're going to be an ongoing sponsor for pizza uh, at each of these Ooh. events, which is a really great contribution and uh, makes <laughs> <laughs> definitely makes the social aspect of our meeting uh, more enjoyable so that you're not starving and wanting to run out of here. Um, Orange Studios, there's usually coupons up front. This space is a collaborative space that uh, you can come in. Uh, grab an office space, camp for the day, work, uh, create your office space out of here. You can get a one-day pass, check it out. I encourage you to do so. Leap Motion, Wiley, Manning, Pearson, O'Reilly, Apress, uh, even the guys from Fourth Transformation have all provided door prizes, which we're going to roll into right now. So, Gordan has the magic what box. What thing over there? Um, so this is how this works. We've got a page somewhere over by Gordana that I'm going to ask once you win. Uh, you come up, draw the next draw number for me if you would, and then go over and sign your name. Some of these prizes are like things like ebooks, and if you don't give us your name and a legible email, you're not going to get the prize. Others are physical prizes, but I'd still like you to give us your name and email so we know who won. And it's really, really helpful to make sure that this is an ongoing thing. If you do have a Twitter handle, please give it to us uh, when you win a prize so that we can congratulate you and uh, the publishers get a little bit of visibility out of who's getting the prize. I encourage you that if you do love one of these books after reading it or um, do something awesome with the leap motion detector, um, please, you know, blog post, share it, do whatever. And let me know if you do so that I can also spread the word and get some visibility and traction to your blog or wherever you posted it. Uh, so with no further ado, let's jump into the Manning Prize. There are a couple of ebooks, and the suggested ebooks here are Unity in Action. I'm going to give two of them away. If you already have Unity in Action, want something else, Manning's really great. They'll let you pick anything out of their ebook library, and you just let them know uh, when he emails you. So we'll start. Um, 
let's see, where did Thomas go? <laughs> Thomas, can I get you to run up and just pull the first number? Where did you put me? <laughs> <laughs> Last four digits, so are? 707035. 7035, and we'll ask, we, we had a thing last week, so I'll ask that nobody puts the tickets back in the box after we draw them. Can you give that to Gordana, please? Thanks. We have a winner, excellent, great, congratulations. So I'll get you to give the ticket to Gordana and pull a new one out of the box. The next Manning door prize is? 7032. 7032, excellent. And, and I'll get you to hand that also. Um, so the next item is a book from Pearson. And this one is And the four digits are? 7036. 7036, I see another hand, excellent. I'll get you to give that to Gordana as well. The Pearson book, if Gordana would hold it up, I believe it's um, Augmented Reality. It's Augmented Reality from Pearson. Gordana, could you hold that a little higher? Thank you. So then the next one is a book from Wiley. Sorry. 7013. 7013. This is going great. Wonderful. Thank you. Uh, next book is a copy of The Fourth Transformation by Robert Scoble and Shell Israel. 7012. Excellent. 7012. Uh, we have a book on AI, I believe, from O'Reilly. 7038. 7038. 7038. Excellent. Joe got that. Joe's coming up. And after the O'Reilly book, the next draw. So um, I'll, I'll help you in a second there. They go basically in this order. The Manning book, there were two e-books in a row, Gordana. Gordana? Manning book were two e-books in a row. Then the Pearson was the augmented reality book. Wiley was the SketchUp, I believe. Is there a SketchUp book yes. in the pile? And then the next one was the fourth transformation, which um, Fourth transformation went to this gentleman up here. Can you come back and put your name down? And then Joe got the uh, AI book for from O'Reilly. Okay. Or sorry, machine learning. Excellent. Sorry, a <laughs> lot of moving parts here. Thanks for bearing with us. Um, so Joe's going to pull a copy of the A Press Holland's development book. Seven zero four zero. 7040. Excellent. And that takes us to what I typically call our grand prize. Leap Motion has been really wonderful. They don't have a particular product. I'll get you to pull one more number. Thank you. 7029. 7029 wins a Leap Motion detector. And I'll take the um, so the Leap Motion Detector also comes with a connector. I, I think tonight is especially important example. The, the demonstration of the connect that was done here off of a server is the exact same kind of configuration. And you might even be able to talk to Thomas about how he coded up that. I don't know that he wants to share the code, but he could give you direction, I'm sure. And that same scenario would work for a Leap Motion Detector in a HoloLens. Also bear in mind that the immersive devices, which I really want to stress, the f one of the first ones in the wild, Sean has with him in the back here. So if you haven't checked out the Acer headset yet, you can at least see it in person. Um, so check that out while you're here, along with all the other great demos that you're going to see tonight. And thank you very much for all that. I think, yeah, pizza, cool. <laughs>